another hour and 15 minutes. We'll be live today at the Miami Book Fair International. It's in downtown Miami on the campus of Miami-Dade uh, College. You can see phone numbers there on the screen. That's because John Ralston Saul is joining us to do a call-in show. You just saw his presentation along with George Packer. 202 is the area code for all of our numbers. If you support the Democrats, 737-0001 is the number for you to call. If you support President Bush, 737-0002 is the number for you to call. And 202-628-0205 for all others. We only have a few minutes with our guest, the Book TV bus is in the middle of the street fair here at the uh, Miami Book Fair and inside the bus is John Ralston Saul. He is the author of this book, The Collapse of Globalism. Mr. Saul, would most people agree with you that globalism is collapsing? I think most people haven't thought about it. I mean, you know, the argument has been dominated by the for and against. I mean, you know, we had 25 years of the for and then increasingly we've had the voices of the against. Uh, and most people are sort of right up close in the in in the battle if you like almost like shadows of each other and nobody's really either been smart or stupid enough to uh, stand back from it and say you know if you actually look at this thing we can see it coming in why we can see it rising and then i think i'd say 1995 that's my take on it then you can see it starting to decline you can see the wheels falling off the bus as i said earlier and 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 you can start to see the world slipping into a kind of confused state uh, going in no particular direction, but a whole bunch of directions at once, what I call the, you know, the confused vacuum between two eras, and I think that's where we are today. But you also talk about nationalism. But I do, I, I agree with you that it's, you know, I'm out there, and sometimes I was at a university here yesterday, and a bunch of bright people, they'd never heard this argument before, but they were bright, so they started reacting to it. Uh, nationalism and China particularly, what's going on there? Well, I think, you know, China, it, the West has always tried to project onto China what it wanted to project onto it. Uh, we're very bad at sort of saying, well, what are the Chinese actually saying among themselves? What do they think they're doing? Why do they think they're doing things? And because we don't actually ever ask ourselves that question, we just keep doing what we did at the time of the Opium Wars in the 19th century or what the British did in the 18th century. We just sort of say, this is what the Chinese are doing. And, you know, you go and ask the Chinese and they think they're actually rebuilding the Middle Kingdom. They think they've got some real problems inside. They have to move really fast. They're not particularly interested in Western economic theories, which we say are global, which they think are Western. Uh, they've got their own ideas. You may like them, you may dislike them, but they're their own ideas about how to do economics and how to organize society. And they have their own problems, you know. And the reinvention of the world is the subtitle of this book. Our first call for our guest is Philadelphia. You're on the air. Go ahead. Yes, hi, John. Philadelphia, you with us? Go ahead. Yes. Uh, John, uh, number one, I'm going to buy your book. I also read uh, The World is Flat, and the conclusion I came after reading that book was that in a perfect world, yes, a globalization can work, but we live in such an unperfect world. And my question to you is, I've been following gold for a long time, and what I've come gold. to realize is lately, the gold is acting the inverse of what it normally does. When oil goes up, gold would go up. When the dollar was weak, gold would go up. It's doing the inverse now. And I think that's showing me signs that the, the world is starting to this instability and the wheels falling off. And I just want to get your thoughts on it because I truly think that there's um, a lack of faith in world currencies and chaos. Mm. That gold to me is going to go to six hundred dollars by next year. And just, just I, I just look at that as a barometer of sentiment and just want to get your thoughts on it. Thank, Thank you. you, caller. That's, that's a really interesting question, actually. I and mean, I think that you, you know, one of the things that has been said more and more by all sorts of economists and bankers and so on, of all stripes for the last, well, certainly in the last decade, is that the financial situation internationally is not sustainable. I mean, this is the most repeated thing about international economics. It's not sustainable. So far, it's lasted. But, you know, at a certain point, history tells us that stuff like this, if it's not solid, uh, does collapse and I suppose it's an interesting argument to say that you know gold would be strengthening that way certainly that's not what should be happening if you know if globalization were actually working working gold would not be going up as if you were in the middle of somewhere in the 19th century and uh, that people were whole you know 
dependent on gold for a belief in stability. I mean, the old thing of the French putting their gold underneath their mattresses and all that stuff. We're almost in an era like that. I, I mean, I sometimes think we're in 1750. I sometimes think we're in the 1930s. I mean, th th this is not the postmodern era that it's described uh, <coughs> as. It's got some, it's got some elements of, uh, you know, the South Sea bubble, uh, the John Law financial collapse era. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a very difficult era to get your finger on, and certainly it is not the era that was predicted in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Where do you put Walmart in that era? Well, I mean, you know, I think we have to wait. It's one of those things where you probably have to wait 10 years to be certain. Uh, it is possible that when we look back in 10 years, you'll have seen that Walmart was very much a character of the globalist era, that it made sense in this rather bizarre period in which people thought, that the most important human rights were low taxes and cheap goods, um, whereas in fact, and, and, and maximum profits, whereas in fact the history of capitalism is that you have to have reasonable profits and uh, reasonable uh, levels of taxes and reasonable prices, because if you don't have reasonable prices, you can't pay your workers. You know, if, if, if I think I mentioned it, Walmart, I don't know, was it 10 or a dozen pairs of underwear in the United States for $7? Well, you know, no American worker can earn a living as a dignified citizen of the United States if the goods they're producing are sold at that wage. So that, that is not actually a capitalist model. The capitalist model is that you get going and the prices have to rise enough to be able to pay wages to give the stability which is required for a middle class democracy. So I think people may look back on it and think that it was just a peculiar phenomenon of this short-lived um, sort of lunacy, which was a belief in, um, you know, that economics was going to determine the shape of the world. Very quickly, short-lived, beginning when? Well, short-lived, uh, I think, you know, you can see the, re it really starts, you don't put dates on it, it really starts with Nixon devaluing the American dollar, so what's that, 70, is that 71 or 73, I forget now. And, you know, at that point you get a kind of uh, a break with the Keynesian period. And then in the confusion, the neoconservative, neoliberal globalists rush in and fill the space. And the, the reigning elite fails in the crisis. Peoria, Illinois, on our Republican line, you're on with John Ralston. Saul, go ahead. Peoria? Hello? Pe go, go ahead, Peoria. No, this is Hello. Alabama. Okay, Alabama, go ahead. Hi, Alabama. Alabama. I just wanted to, re I just wanted to go Republican for Bush. Okay, well, thank you for your call. We appreciate that. Reno, Nevada, good afternoon. You're on Book TV. Reno, are you with us? Yes, I'm with you. Can you hear me? Go ahead with your comment, please. Okay, Mr. Saul, you mentioned racism as a thematic um, upon returning from Europe. It wasn't exactly clear to me what you meant. But I was wondering whether you could touch on the question of European identity um, within the theme of this collapse of globalism. Well, I think you had, you know, what, what's fascinating, and I'm a big supporter of Europe. I'm a Canadian, but I'm big, I think Europe is a fantastic, the project is a fantastic project. The difficulty uh, was that, you know, after the war, the Second World War, when they started putting it together, uh, the elites kind of lost their courage. They thought the easiest way to do this is as top down. So let's do the administration, uh, let's integrate the economy, let's do some political stuff, and the rest will follow. Well, of course, they found themselves a half century later with this really brilliant experiment in place, and they suddenly realized that they, even though technically it was all democratic, they hadn't done that thing which happens inside a nation state, which is there really hadn't been any discussion among the citizens. There, there's virtually no program in Europe uh, to move school kids around. So there's one elite program, the Erasmus program, the university level, but you know, the taking school kids and moving them into other countries for a month so they get to know, you know, a German kid gets to know what French kids' lives are like and what it's really like sort of thing. Not that they're going to become French, but that they, they're able, as philosophers say, to imagine the other. They didn't do any of that. So they find themselves semi-integrated from the power point of view and the administrative point of view and totally disintegrated from the human point of view. So at a certain point, which is in a sense the point of the, of the beginning of the breakdown of globalization, you get of course the beginning of a stall in Europe. And not surprising, the people who made the wrong decisions in Europe about let's do it from the top and leave out the people were among the leaders of the globalist movement, people like Schmidt and Giscard d'Estaing and so on. So, sorry, but the more specific answer to your question is that that, that 
they were on the edge, and I think it's maybe gone forever, we'll see. They were on the edge of a very interesting experiment, which was getting rid of the old idea of the nation state, the 19th century, 18th century idea of the nation state, which brought all those murders, the 20th century disasters, and all the rest of it. And going back to something that you could call the Erasmus idea, the, the high Middle Ages at its best, which is multiple borders, multiple loyalties, multiple existences, multiple personalities. And, you know, uh, people, Europeans who would have a multiple personality order, you know, instead of a multiple personality disorder, so that you could say, well, I'm actually from the Mediterranean. That's a real culture. Provence or Italy or Barcelona. I'm uh, from France. Uh, I'm from Western Europe. Uh, I'm from Southern Europe. And these are all real loyalties. And that's a new kind of existence going back to an old experiment. And I, Unfortunately, I think that the rise of classical nationalism means that we may have lost it again. What's your view about the U.S.? Well, you probably have a more interesting statement than I would. I mean, I think it's, you know, this is an amazing country, and it's a country which has always had, I mean, I notice you have people calling in, as, according to their memberships, in two political parties, but, but from an historical and a philosophical point of view, this is a country which has two great traditions, which aren't necessarily divided by those two parties. In fact, it's changed around. And, and they really, there's the great humanist tradition, the Enlightenment, uh, some of the very great, the noble ideas of the origin of the United States. And then there's the nationalist United States of, you know, the, the, the Jacksonian early 19th century thing. And since, the, I don't know, the 1830s or so, the, the, the United States goes back and forth between the two. I mean, it's never clear. But what is, I suppose, seems to be happening now is that the United States seems to be entering into one of those nationalist phases. In fact, it's in it. And that's one of the signs of the collapse of globalism, is that when, when the most powerful country in the world becomes very nationalistic, of course, it's a message to the rest of the world that it's okay to be really nationalistic. So in other words, the beginning of globalization, you see this decline of the idea of nationalism. And here, 25, 35 years later, you see nationalism coming back, and at the core of it, is the greatest nation in the world, you know, the most powerful, the, the leader of the idea of democracy, I mean, itself engaging in, seeing itself in nationalistic terms. So that's, you know, that's a very interesting thing to think about. Our guest is John Ralston Saul. Here, his, here is his book, The Collapse of Globalism. Montville, New Jersey, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Montville, go ahead, please, with your comment. Yes, hello. Um, I have two quick uh, but disparate questions uh, for Dr. Saul. Uh, one is, uh, what would, is his take on the source of momentum behind engagement in China policy going back to the very late 80s and early 90s? I have my own suspicions. Of what, what is the source of, what is, sorry, what is the source of? The momentum Caller, behind could you uh, the whole policy okay. of engagement. Um, of course, you know, getting China, first of all, into GATT, and then, of course, getting rid of the yearly most favored nation vote, et cetera, and then to where we are now. Uh, I have my own suspicions about where the source of the momentum behind that is, but I'll leave that to you. The second is, um, what do you feel about self-policing or self-regulation uh, when we look at something like Enron, for example, when we established an energy market uh, and it was allowed to police itself uh, and we quickly um, devolved to the lowest common denominator ethically, resulting in, of course, what we've all seen uh, in the late 90s with the debacle, excuse me, in 2001 with Enron. Um, thank you, caller. We got you. the point. Dr. Well, on the uh, second point first, um, it, you know, a big mistake was made in Western civilization. How's that for you know, a narrow start? which was to confuse commercial contracts with social contracts. And they're two separate things. And, uh, you know, criminal law, the law that has to do with us as real people, is, is, you know, is written in order to deal with the 2, 3, 4 percent of the population who will perhaps break the law. The assumption in all civilizations is that 95 percent of the population will do the right thing whether the law exists or not. So in other words, you have to stay away in a, in, a, in, a, in a decent civilization from the idea that the reason laws are there is everyone will run amok if you don't have the laws. They don't run amok, because if they did run amok, I mean, you'd have all sorts of things happening that aren't happening. Um, commercial law is a completely different matter. Once you're in an area where you're not talking about the public good, but you're talking about self-interest, 
now you no longer have a fundamental ethical limit on what can happen. That doesn't mean it's a bad thing, self-interest. Self-interest is an essential part of our civilization. But we've known, we have always known, it goes right back to the Greeks. In fact, it goes back beyond the Greeks. It goes back to, you know, Gilgamesh and the Abyss, I mean, it, 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 Tigris and Euphrates. That, that, that the free market works best when it is cleanly and effectively and efficiently regulated. By regulating it in a neat and tidy way, which is a key point, you actually liberate the market to be more competitive and for greater profits to be made and for wealth to be created. When you deregulate it too much, and this is you know, always searching for the balance, when you de over deregulate, what you get is your Enron situation. There is no way in which a private sector can regulate itself. And I'm not making a comment about the United States or Canada. I'm making a comment about 4,000 years of history. I mean, uh, there's no civilization in the history of the world which has believed for any length of time that the marketplace can regulate itself. It does not exist. And no serious economist has ever proposed it. And I can tell you that someone like Adam Smith, who is, you know, the most misquoted man in the history of the world, I would say, mainly by economists who don't read Adam Smith but quote him, and they read, they read the kind of excerpts that suit them, but they don't really read Adam Smith. I mean, Adam Smith would go mad at the idea that the, the private sector was supposed to regulate itself. You say, are you fools? Are you naive? I mean, are you crazy? Of course it's not going to work out. Um, so, the trick is, can you have neat, tidy, fast, efficient regulations that allow it to go? So, uh, and that was one of the delusions of the globalist period, that because the nation state was going to weaken, therefore, economists at the international level were going to take over and they could not be regulated. And therefore, the marketplace would have to regulate itself. That was the theory. But of course, it was a bogus theory. Because in fact, uh, you know, as I said in my talk, there are many, many examples of nation states or groups of nation states regulating things. I mean, in fact, your very impressive antitrust uh, group, having lost its courage for quite a few years, has got it back and is doing a pretty effective job. In fact, you've just indicted a former Canadian citizen, Conrad Black, uh, shown that you're way ahead of the Canadians and the British who could have done it years ago. So, I mean, you know, the, the second issue um, was what drives the, the, the China thing. I think one is what I said earlier, which is we, we're always pretending China is something. It's what we want it to be as opposed to what it really is. And so we're always saying, God, if we only get China in, if we could only get China to do things our way. And we never sort of ask ourselves, well, you know, what is it that China wants to do? What's China up to? And so when, 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 when the moment comes, we're, we're shocked, as, as the globalists have been very shocked in the last six months when they suddenly, you know, they said, we're for China coming into globalism. Uh, and then they suddenly look up, they're in this little valley of true belief, and they look up and they see, I don't know, a trillion tons of goods dropping on their heads. And they say, oh my God, that's not what we meant by globalization. You know, you, you've got to put tariffs on yourselves. You've got to, you've got to put your currency up. And the, and the Chinese say, you said you wanted us to do it your way. You were doing it your way. So then you discover that what, what really it was about was that our people in the West, the United States, Canada, France, Germany, we were in favor of globalization, borderless globalization, providing the headquarters were in the West. As soon as we discover that the headquarters are going to be in China, we don't like it. So then we start putting the brakes on. And now, I mean, there's some specific questions that has to do with, you know, jobs. And, but they should have thought of that. I mean, it wasn't rocket science to know that once you brought the barriers down, it, 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 you know, it's the Walmart question. We couldn't produce the underwear at those prices because we want to have public schools. You know, we want to have various kinds of health care. We want to have a middle class society. So there's no way we could compete. We knew that. I mean, if these tenured economists and these heads of corporations and these senior civil servants took till now to figure this out, they're really in trouble. And they put us in trouble. You know. Kate May, New Jersey, you're on with John Ralston Saul. Go ahead. Kate May, go Ralston. ahead, please. Dr. Rall, you are a very, very brilliant man. Um, and very I agree well. with brilliant. everything you say. I, I have a bad cold. You are a very brilliant man, and I agree with everything you say. I would like to know if you think, well, before, what I'd like to know is how low do you think and how much trouble do you think the United States will have to get into with the wheels fall, before the wheels fall off? And it, will we ever, do you think there's any chance that we will ever elect an honest, man like a Ralph Nader type. 
Thank you, caller. Dr. Saul. Well, um, I think the, the, the big question for the United States, and I could be wrong about this, if you don't say it, the big question is this sort of double debt situation. On the one hand, the internal debt, um, uh, which you know has been created, uh, really taken up to a whole serious level in the last few years, and then the international debt, which of course China is a key player in. The combination of these two things, and I'm, there's nothing original in what I'm saying, this is a big problem for the United States and therefore for the world, let's face it. I mean, if the United States has a big problem, the world's got a big problem. And I don't know how you or any of us get out of it. You know, uh, it's not going to be, I mean, you could improve it slightly by cutting, you know, cutting back seriously on government spending, but then you'd create other problems depending on what you cut, right? Um, because there's some real poverty problems, there's some real education problems. So if you start cutting in that area, you're actually creating a bigger long-term problem. So the only place you've got to cut is the military, and I have absolutely no idea that's your affair, whether you want to cut in that area or not. But you don't actually have, in the social area, much you can cut without provoking other long-term social and economic problems. So, you know, Nixon tried to deal with an international problem like that by devaluing the American dollar. That's, and that provoked some serious inflation and drop in growth. Uh, it is conceivable that a presidential candidate or a president might turn around sometime in the next five to ten years and say, um, you know, uh, we're the most powerful country in the world, we've got this army, and we only have 15% of our GDP, which is international trade, so we're really not dependent on the world, interestingly enough, from a trade point of view, you know, compared to Canada or Germany or anything. I mean, you're not a big trader in, in, in terms of your own economy. Um, you could just, I mean, they might just decide to slash the dollar. I mean, in other words, they might try one of the three or four methods there are for getting rid of this debt, because it's simply unserviceable, un can't deal with it anymore. And then, then we're probably into a protectionist uh, closed borders era if that happens. So that's, that's the big risk. So if you actually kind of just listen to what people are saying, and what people keep saying is the financial markets are unstable, the debt situation is unmanageable, this is really a problem. And you, you, I mean, it's not just me. I mean, I mean, all sorts of people are saying that from right to left. And nothing is being done which is even heading in the direction of dealing with that. Um, so, I actually haven't answered your question, and I actually don't know what the answer is, frankly. I think it's a big problem, really big problem. But what it indicates is that the globalist theory is, on, it, it is very seriously on its way out. Well, on page 147 oh of, my God. <laughs> of your book, you say that the most obvious failure of globalization has been its capacity to maintain employment. Right. The U.S. is around 5, a little over 5% unemployment. Yeah. Germany, France, 10 to 12%. Right, right. I'm not sure. I think Canada is doing quite well right Six. now. But it's so, the best number we've had in years. Yeah. So put that together. Well, it, it, uh, let me put it to you this way, and, and, and numbers are very tricky, as we know. I mean, in fact, you know, I just look at them all and I think, oh my God, who's lying or what works here? Uh, the OECD base numbers more or less are that in 1970, we're beginning of globalization, we were at about 10 million unemployed in the OECD. Um, and then each decade it kind of goes up by 7 to 10 million. And today, if officially, the numbers are 40, 40 million. This is not because new people join the OECD. That's not where the new unemployment comes from, by the way. It comes entirely out of the old membership. Now, so that's a four times increase in unemployment at a time when, uh, as I said in my talk, you know, trade went up 22 times, you know, financial markets exploded, etc. Now, here's the key point. You didn't say 40 million. That bad. Mrs. Thatcher, in her time in office, redefined unemployment over 20 times. Each time she was defining unemployment, of course, it was very carefully getting numbers off the list, right? You know, this is not unemployment, this is semi-retirement, this is retraining, this is, right? And uh, I think she has the record, but I mean, Canada did the same, the United States did the same, France did the same, Germany. So the real figures are probably closer to about 50, 60 million unemployed in the OECD. So these are remarkable numbers. And then that doesn't take into account the fact that we moved from uh, uh, 
a middle class family with two children, you know, your average middle class family of the 50s and 60s, uh, one bread earner being able to support the family. Now, they consumed less, but nevertheless, you know, usually a man, uh, sometimes a woman, was able to support the wife and two children. A simpler life, but nevertheless. Today, those families have, you know, 1.5 children, and um, the husband and the wife work, and they're having trouble. So, all of the numbers about how it works have, have slipped, in effect. And, you know, as you know, you have a whole bunch of people who don't appear at all in the unemployment numbers who are doing two and three part-time jobs, unsecured. And that's yet another group who really didn't exist in the same way in the 50s and 60s. So the numbers are actually quite worrying. I mean, I'm not saying they're unsustainable, but they're, what they suggest is this incredible dichotomy between, or contradiction between the increase in the money markets, the increase in trade, and not real growth. I mean, if I were a woman, I'd be outraged. I mean, the biggest change in the last 50 years, and certainly in the last 35 years, is that women as a whole came into the workforce. So we had women being you know, exploited, cheap labor, etc., earlier on in factories. But now we've got, you know, women on the Supreme Court, women on, you know, in the United States, Canada, the head of our Supreme Court's a woman. And we have, I think, three women on the court. I can't remember how many you've got now, but two. Uh, and, you know, women are doing all these important jobs and they're at middle levels and so on. But in a way, given the numbers I've just, but the situation I've described to you, in this period, we have inflated away the real wealth creation, which the arrival of women in the marketplace represents. I mean, it is the most insulting thing done to women in the 20th century, that this enormous breakthrough was made in getting women into the workforce at all levels. And then it's, you know, that, you know, not cheap goods at Walmart, that should have represented like a 50% increase in real, real wealth creation. And instead of that, it's been inflated away. It's a very, it's a great failure for current economics. In just a few minutes, the uh, John Hope Franklin event will begin. Next call for John Ralston Saul comes from Herndon, Virginia, in the Washington, D.C. suburbs. Go ahead, Herndon. Hi, Dr. Saul. Uh, I was calling because uh, on two subjects that you just had, when you were talking about uh, the price of, you know, seven pairs of underwear and the, the uh, manufacturing of that, it, it seemed like when I look in China, and those are hidden numbers, is the middle class dying? in uh, the United States and really throughout the rest of the world. Thank you, caller. Well, you know, the numbers say that there's a lot of pressure on the middle middle class. I mean, most of the numbers show that this is the group that's having, uh, the, that should have been the glory, if you like, of, uh, of Western democracies, that we would all become middle class. And of course we'd have, you know, unfortunately some people who slipped through the bottom, and of course we'd have some people who slipped through the top, but that, you know, our society would be like a diamond that the big part of the society would be in the middle. And what we've seen in the globalist period has been the exact opposite, which is a, we're starting to look more and more like a pyramid with, you know, a little group at the top and then this sort of bigger and bigger and bigger as you move down. And an enormous pressure on the middle, on, on the middle class. And, and I, I think I described some of those things. A lot of it is a sort of uh, hidden inflation, which is not counted. And that, I described the situation of the women's contribution as one of them. Uh, hidden inflation, which is not counted, which means that, we're, that, 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 that the wealth slips away, the middle class stability slips away, and yet we're unable to identify it except that we feel it happening. We sense that it's happening, and yet nobody's counting the numbers in the right way anymore. So that, you know, we're using very old fashioned economic methods, so we can't really identify in this kind of world what is happening to the middle class. Except periodically they say, you know, division between rich and poor is getting bigger. The Collapse of Globalism is the book. Next call, New Milford, Connecticut. Go ahead. Hi, Dr. Saul. Um, I'd like to Hi. ask you about a book I read, uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman by John Perkins. And his premise... I read about it. I haven't read it. Yeah, mm. okay. His premise was that he would go into countries, developing countries in South America, the Middle East, Iran being one, and he would put together a projection telling them that they're going to have tremendous growth of 20% or more. And they would contract with United States companies, or not just the United States, but big companies, and build all kinds of infrastructure yeah. that they really didn't need. Uh, the, the projections were too high, and that was his job, to put in these false projections. Uh, then they would, default, they would incur debt 
to build the, these projects. They would default on the debt, and U.S. corporations would come in and take over the projects and charge for, say, water or different things within these developing countries. Uh, I just wanted to get your uh, opinion on that and how things like that have affected the global economy. Or if you think that those things really happened, if they did, how, what was the effect on the economy, global economy? Yeah, I mean, I haven't read the book. My understanding of it is that it's, you know, a pretty sharp view. I think you felt pretty negatively about what had been happening. Uh, put it in slightly more general terms, I think that, you know, one of our characteristics is, uh, you know, we've done pretty well for ourselves, you know, within the context of up and down. Um, we really have a tendency to want to tell other people what to do. When I say we, I mean, you know, don't take it personally. I mean, I think everybody in Western civilization seems to come out of the Judeo-Christian tradition or something. I don't know. And um, we're just endlessly finding new ways of going into other continents and basically saying that, that if they really want to be happy, they've got to do it our way. And we're not, you know, you know, the fundamental philosophical idea, and it's not just Western, is are you capable of imagining the other? The other is the unknown, not somebody you know, not somebody you necessarily like, just the other. Can you imagine them? And the imagining the means that, not that they're better or worse, not that their methods are perhaps entirely acceptable, but that perhaps they have a geography, a tradition, a, an approach which has some good things in it. And that if they're going to find their way to the same levels of stability and prosperity which we've had at various times, then they're going to have to do it in a somewhat different way. They're not simply going to do it by imitating us. And somehow, if you look at the post-Second World War period, I mean, we went into Africa right after the Second World War. You know, we brought a lot of people to our countries. We educated them. We sent them home. We went in and said, here's what you do. We did it. it was a, they did it. It was a mess. Then we brought them back in and said, now, here's another way. You have to do this. You know, like we'd forgotten the first step. And now we're into the third stage of telling Africa what to do. You know, and I, I was just in South Africa, and I, you know, I said to people, uh, I said, you know, be careful. You might find yourself leaping into the globalist boat only to find a that it's sinking and b that the west has already jumped out and gone in another boat i mean we we have to learn to be more careful with the way in which we try to save other people and um it uh i don't know what it is i mean to say i look at the language around china i mean this is 19th century language we're using uh uh we're we're, we're not very good at teaching about other traditions and this doesn't mean that they don't have enormous problems that they don't have enormous things they need to change but there has to be a way for them to change it through their own logic you know and and that's something we have to learn to do and we're we, with our advantages it's up to, up to us not to insist that our way is the only way that there have to be ways within their way which will help them to deal better with whether the issues are, whether it's the treatment of women or the way they deal with their economy. I mean, you know, the marketplace. Well, there have always been marketplaces. There have always been forms of trade, forms of free market, forms of regulation. And um, they vary. And often they are appropriate to the kind of uh, climate or civilization or religion or ethics that this particular area has and we can trace all of that uh, so you can't just sort of take you know what works in London and say okay now this is the way to do a financial market and go to some completely different place maybe that's not the way they're gonna you know the reason that Southeast Asia had its meltdown in 97 was that we insisted that the way to run a financial market was our way and we actually destabilized Southeast Asia by not paying attention to the fact that they had a very high savings rate because that's what they do in those countries that uh, that actually they had great stability we said it was crony capitalism but actually real capitalism is about people knowing each other real owners actually knowing each other that's how you run a company that's what Adam Smith was in favor of so we made this big argument that what was wrong in Thailand and what was wrong in Malaysia was crony capitalism why because we moved past that and now have these large corporations where nobody really owns them and they're run by managers so we sort of wanted them to have this disembodied managerial system which wouldn't have suited them at all Voltaire's Bastards and Reflections of a Siamese Twin are a couple of the other books that John Ralston Saul has written Las Vegas go ahead with your question yes I want to say this you're a very intelligent man and you actually should have an hour-long show next to Oprah 
to educate us American <laughs> people. Um, well, you're I, pretty educated. I don't know. Man, through and through, uh, moved here to this town in ninety uh, eighty four. Worked construction nine years. When I got up in the morning, and I went to work, and I went to the store, I looked for Made in USA. That means when I got up in the morning at six o'clock. My fellow American working man was getting up and going to work and producing quality American goods. The globalization that you speak of, I hope it does fail, and I hope America does not collapse in the middle of it like the Romans, the Greeks, the Egyptians. And I disagree with any Democratic or Republican official who run this country out of pure greed. And the fact that we deal with a communist nation called China is going to come back, in my opinion, to bite us. I don't believe in buying anything from China, but I don't have too much of a choice anymore, it seems. Now, my point is, when are the wheels going to fall off, or when are the American people going to get the wool pulled back above their eyes and not listen to these goofy politicians that are supposed to be running this country to protect the citizens? What do, you, what, do you understand where I'm coming from? Yeah, I mean, I think that there, you know, in what you're saying, there are... Uh, let, let me say something, you, you, you know, you... This is an odd thing I'm going to say, okay? Um, most of the economic theories that we're using today, which you're describing, which have led us to the, some of the contradictions you're talking about, um, most of those economic theories were invented in the 19th century. Uh, and one of the things about the 19th century, you know, the height of capitalism and so on, was that we had a scarcity of goods. You know, people couldn't go to the store and see an enormous selection. Uh, we were short shoes, we were short socks, we were short, you know, glasses, we were short food. Everything was scarcity. And the thought was that uh, if, um, if we could uh, use technology and well-run competition with, you know, half-decent regulations, we could actually, through this mechanism, drive the economy forward and get more production and get more goods, right? And that, that, that would be real growth. And then, you know, the 19th century with its ups and downs and the early 20th century, that's what that's about. But since the Second World War, the Western world, you know, 20 odd democracies, has been in surplus. You know, we, you, you think about it. I mean, one of the reasons that, you know, we've we got too much underwear, you know, we've got too many socks, we've got too many soft drinks, we've got too much food. Uh, we're just, overflowing with surplus and the problem is we're using an economic theory which is all about scarcity and so it's sort of the, it's a contradictory system it simply doesn't work for the West anymore and this is I think one of the things that's driving prices down it's one of the reasons where we keep looking for cheaper ways to produce goods in other countries there's nothing wrong with international production but the purpose of international production is not to undermine the country to which you're bringing the goods I mean, the, you should be able to do international production and trade without it creating, uh, you know, a disastrous situation, for example, for, for American workers. That's not what's supposed to happen. And the reason it seems to be happening is because of this contradiction between economics of scarcity and a reality of surplus. And it sort of creates this impossible contradiction inside a place like the United States. I don't know if that relates a little bit to, 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 to helps in a, little, uh, in a way, and it's, it's, nobody else is saying this, so God knows if I'm right, but I, I've been thinking about it for quite a while, and I do think this is one of the, you know, one of the problems. Well, Time Magazine describes you as a prophet, so maybe you are right. Our guest, John Ralston Saul, unfortunately has to leave, otherwise we'd keep him and uh, have him take a few more calls. He's got to catch a flight. John Hope Franklin is running late, and we'll bring that event to you as soon as it starts, and that will be live. We're live here in Miami at the Miami Book Fair International, Miami-Dade College, downtown Miami. And in the meantime, we want to show you the Southeastern bestseller list for this week. hour and 15 minutes we'll be live today at the Miami Book Fair International. It's in downtown Miami on the campus of Miami-Dade uh, College 
You can see phone numbers there on the screen. That's because John Ralston Saul is joining us to do a call-in show. You just saw his presentation along with George Packer. 202 is the area code for all of our numbers. If you support the Democrats, 737-0001 is the number for you to call. If you support President Bush, 737-0002 is the number for you to call. And 202-628-0205 for all others. We only have a few minutes with our guests. The Book TV bus is in the middle of the street fair here at the uh, Miami Book Fair. And inside the bus is John Ralston Saul. He is the author of this book, The Collapse of Globalism. But I do, I, I agree with you that it's, you know, I'm out there and sometimes I was at a university here yesterday and a bunch of bright people, they'd never heard this argument before, but they were bright so they started reacting to it. Uh, nationalism and China particularly, what's going on there? Well, I think, you know, China, is, the West has always tried to project onto China what it wanted to project onto it. Uh, we're very bad at sort of saying, well, what are the Chinese actually saying among themselves? What do they think they're doing? Why do they think they're doing things? And because we don't actually ever ask ourselves that question, we just keep doing what we did at the time of the Opium Wars in the 19th century or what the British did in the 18th century. We just sort of say, this is what the Chinese are doing. And, you know, you go and ask the Chinese and they think they're actually rebuilding the Middle Kingdom. They think they've got some real problems inside. They have to move really fast. They're not particularly interested in Western economic theories, which we say are global, which they think are Western. Uh, they've got their own ideas. Now. And I think that's showing me signs that the, the world is starting to see this instability and the wheels falling off. And I just want to get your thoughts on it, because I truly think that there's um, a lack of faith in world currencies and chaos. Mm. That gold, to me, is going to go to $600 or by next year. And just, just I, I just look at that as a barometer of sentiment and just want to get your thoughts on it. Thank you, Thank you caller. That's, that's a really interesting question, actually. I and mean, I think that you, you know, one of the things that has been said more and more by all sorts of economists and bankers and so on, of all stripes for the last well, certainly in the last decade is that the financial situation internationally is not sustainable. I mean, this is the most repeated thing about international economics. It's not sustainable. So far, it's lasted. But, you know, at a certain you may like them, you may dislike them, but they're their own ideas about how to do economics and how to organize society. And they have their own problems, you know. And the reinvention of the world is the subtitle of this book. Our first call for our guest is Philadelphia. You're on the air. Go ahead. Yes. Hi, John. Philadelphia, are you with us? Go ahead. Yes. Uh, John, uh, number one, I'm going to buy your book. I also read uh, The World is Flat, and the conclusion I came after reading that book was that in a perfect world, yes, a globalization can work, but we live in such an imperfect world. And my question to you is, I've been following gold for a long time, and what I've come gold. to realize is lately the gold is acting the inverse of what it normally does. When oil goes up, gold would go up. When the dollar was weak, gold would go up. It's doing the inverse. Mr. Saul, would most people agree with you that globalism is collapsing? I think most people haven't thought about it. I mean, you know, the argument has been dominated by the for and against. I mean, you know, we had 25 years of the for, and then increasingly we've had the voices of the against. Uh, and most people are sort of right up close in the in in the battle if you like almost like shadows of each other and nobody's really either been smart or stupid enough to uh, stand back from it and say you know if you actually look at this thing we can see it coming in why we can see it rising and then i think i'd say 1995 that's my take on it then you can see it starting to decline you can see the wheels falling off the bus as i said earlier and 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 you can start to see the world slipping into a kind of confused state uh, going in no particular direction, but a whole bunch of directions at once, what I call the, you know, the confused vacuum between two eras, and I think that's where we are today. But you also talk about nationalism.